Yo, 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 what's up? This is Coach Skip Funday kicking it back once again for you and for yours. And um, this one right here, I just came up recently about um, Joe Biden, about the white, you know, between a Joe Biden supporter, which is the white woman, Hillary Rosen, or the Jewish woman, Hillary Rosen, and a Bernie Sanders supporter, which is the black woman, Nita. And she came up saying she brought up Martin Luther King's letter from a Birmingham jail. Taught these white moderates is it's the same thing when Martin Luther King warned us about in letter from the Birmingham jail. So let's see what happens next. People, I mean, it's very much in the tradition of President FDR. It's in the same spirit. It's, it's in the spirit of Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., who, in his letter to the Birmingham jail, yes. warned us, us being the black community, about white moderates. You know, Nina referenced um, Dr. Martin Luther King before saying that uh, he said from the Birmingham jail that we should be um, concerned about white moderates. That's actually not what Martin Luther King said. What he said is he we should be worried that. about the silence about Dr. Martin of Luther white King moderates. Jr. What Are he, you kidding me? Nina? Wait, no, there's, she's making he, a language point. What, Nina, what he she, said was we should worry about the silence of white moderates. Chris, what Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. was talking about, he said it is the point that the white moderate wants things to be comfortable and instead of focusing in on that, the bigger threat is not necessarily the white a KKK member, but more the white moderate that is more comfortable you when know keeping what? things don't, the same don't you, like there don't is use no Martin Luther King against Joe Biden. Deal. You, you don't have I'm that. Nobody, you don't have all, that standing. First of all, I'm Emily, sorry. You, you don't. don't. Don't tell me what kind of standing you, I have you, as a black woman in America. It, How dare you? You have a lot of standing as a black woman in America. You don't have the standing to attack Joe Biden using Martin Luther King's words. That's I didn't attack point. anybody. You're taking it. You're taking it that way. Listen, don't dip into what I have to say about the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. How dare you, oh, as no, a no, white no. woman, I'm not gonna try that. to tell me? Yeah, that no, is not no, what I said. Don't you do I'm, that. What Nina, I'm supposed Hillary, to feel and what I'm doing right I'm now. I'm out of time on this. That's Chris, I didn't jump in on her Nina, though. Well, and then she wants to jump in on me. Okay, and first of all, nobody jumping in on anybody. You guys are in the same parts. Was that not one of the craziest attempts of gaslighting that you've ever seen in your life? And all right, now, well, we know, we've seen that. we seen one popped off on that one. So let's see what Martin Luther King really said. Now, this is a letter from the Birmingham jail by Martin Luther King. From a Birmingham jail, he was in prison as a participant in a nonviolent demonstration against segregation. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. wrote in longhand the letter which follows. It was response to a public statement of concern and caution issued by eight white religious leaders of the South. King, who was born in 1929, did his undergraduate work at Morehouse College and attended the Integrated Cultural Theological Seminar in Chester, Pennsylvania, one of black six black pupils among hundreds of students, and the president of his class, and won a fellowship for Boston at Boston University for his PhD. While confined here in Birmingham City Jail, I came across a recent statement calling our present activities unwise and untimely. Seldom, if ever, do I pause to answer such criticism of my work and ideas. If I sought to answer all the criticism that came across my desk, my secretaries would be engaged in little else in the course of the day. Of course, I have no time for this constructive work. But since I feel that you, a man, are genuine good will, and your criticisms are sincere set forth, I would like to answer your statement and hope I would be patient in reasonable terms. I think you should give reason for my being in Birmingham since you have been influenced by the argument of outsiders coming in. It is an honor to have served as the president of the Southern Christian Leadership Council Conference, an organization operating in every southern state with headquarters in Atlanta, Georgia. We have 85 affiliate organizations across the South, one being Alabama Christian Movement for Human Rights. When necessary and possible, we share staff education, and financial resources with our affiliates. Several months ago, local affiliate here in Birmingham invited us to on call to engage in a nonviolent direct action program, if such was deemed necessary. We regularly, we readily consented and came here and living up to our promises. So I'm here along with several of my members of my staff because we were invited here. I am here because I have the basic organizational ties here. Beyond this, I am in Birmingham because of injustice here. 
Just as the eighth century prophets left their little villages and carrying dust, thus said, thus said the Lord, far beyond the boundaries of their hometowns, and just as Apostle Paul left the little village of Taurus and carried the gospel of Jesus Christ to practically every hamlet and every city in the Greco Roman world, I too am compelled to carry the gospel of freedom beyond my particular hometown. Like Paul, I must consistently respond to the Macedonian call for aid. Furthermore, I am cognizant of the interrelated of all the communities and states. I cannot sit idly by in Atlanta and be not concerned what is happening here in Birmingham. Injustice everywhere is a threat to justice. Injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. We are caught in an incapable network of mutuality tied in a single garment of destiny. Whatever affects one directly affects all indirectly. Never again can we afford to live with a narrow, provincial, outside agitator idea. Anyone who lives inside the United States can never be considered an outsider. You deplore the demonstration that's presently taking place in Birmingham, but I'm sorry that your statement did not go unexpressed a similar concern for the conditions that brought about the demonstration to, into being. I am sure that each of you will want to go beyond a superficial social analyst who looks merely at the effects of what does not grapple with the underlying issues. I will not hesitate to say that it is unfortunate the so-called demonstrations that are taking place in Birmingham at this time, but I will say in more empathetic terms that even more unfortunate the white power structure of the city left the Negro community with no other alternative, without other alternatives. In any nonviolent campaign, there are four basic steps. Collection of the facts to determine whether injustices are alive. Negotiation, self-purification, and direct action. We have gone through all these steps in Birmingham. There can be no gang saying of the fact that the racial injustice engulfs this community. Birmingham is probably the most thoroughly segregated city in the United States. Its record for police brutality is known in every section of this country. Its unjust treatment of Negroes in courts is a notorious reality. There have been more unsolved bombings on Negro homes and churches in Birmingham than in any other city in this nation. These are hard, brutal, and unbelievable facts. On the basis of them, the Negro leaders sought to negotiate with the city fathers, but the political leaders would consistently refuse to engage in good faith negotiations. Then came the opportunity last September to talk with some of the leaders of the economic community. In these negotiations, sessions were certain promises were made by merchants, such as the promise to remove the humiliating racial signs from the store. On the basis of these promises, Reverend Shuttlesworth and leaders of the Atlanta, Alabama Christian Movement for Human Rights agreed to call a moratorium on any type of demonstrations. As weeks and months unfolded, we realized we were the victims of broken promises. The signs remain. As in so many experiences of the past, we were confronted with blasted hopes and a dark shadow of deep disappointment settled upon us. So we had no alternative except that preparing for a direct action where we present our very bodies as a means of laying our cause before the conscience of the local and national community. We were not mindful of the difficulties involved, so we decided to go through the process of self-purification. We started having workshops on nonviolence and pretty asked ourselves, are you able to set the blows without retaliating, and are you able to deal ordeals of jail? We decided, to, we decided to set our direct action program around Easter season, realizing that with the exception of Christmas, this is the largest shopping period of the year, knowing that a strong economic withdrawal program will be the byproduct of direct action. We felt that this was the best time to bring on the pressure on the merchants for need for change. Then it occurred to us that March election was ahead, so we speedily decided to postpone the action to after election day. When we discovered that Mr. Connor was in the runoff, we decided again to propose the action so that the demonstrators could not be used to cloud the issue. At this time, we agreed to begin our nonviolent witness the day after the runoff. This revealed that if we did not move, if we did not move irresponsibly to direct action, we too wanted to see Mr. Connor defeated. So we went to the postponement after postponement to aid in this community need. 
After this, we felt the direct action could not could be delayed no longer. Well, if you ask, why direct action? Why sit-ins, marches, and so forth? Isn't negotiation a better path? You are exactly right in your call for negotiation. Indeed, this is the purpose of direct action. Nonviolent direct action seeks to create such a crisis and establish such a creative tension that a community that has no longer refused to negotiate is forced to confront the issue. It seeks so to dramatize the issue that is no longer to be ignored. I just refer to the creation of tension as part of the work of the nonviolent resistance. This may seem rather shocking, but I must confess I am not afraid of the word tension. I have earnestly worked and preached against violent tension, but there is a type of construction nonviolent tension that is necessary for growth. Just as Socrates felt that it was necessary to create a tension in the mind so individuals could rise from the bondage of myths and half truths to unfurl the realm of creativity, analysis, and objective appraisal, we must see the end of having nonviolent gadflies to create the kind of tension in society that will help men to rise from the dark paths of prejudice, racism, and the majestic things of understanding and brotherhood. So the purpose of direct action is to create a situation so crisis-packed that it will only open the doors to negotiation. We therefore concur with you in your call for negotiation. Too long our beloved Southland has been bogged down in a tragic attempt to live in a monologue rather than dialogue. One of the basic points in your statement is our act is untimely. Some have asked, why didn't you give the new administration time to act? The only answer I can give to this inquiry is that the new administration must be proud about as much as the outgoing one before it acts. We will be sadly mistaken if we felt the election of Mr. Portwell will bring the millennial change to Birmingham. Mr. Brutwell is much more articulate and a general man than Mr. Connor. They are both segregationists, dedicated to the task of maintaining the status quo. I hope to see that Mr. Brutwell is that he is reasonable enough to see the futility and the mass resistance and desegregation. But he will not see without further pressures from the devotees of civil rights. My friends, I must say to you that we are not made a single gang of civil rights. Let me read that again. My friends, I must say to you that we have not made a single gang in civil rights without determined legal and nonviolent pressure. History is long and tragic story of the fact that the privileged groups seldom give up their rights voluntarily. Individuals may have to see moral light and voluntarily give up their unjust posture. But as Reinho Nimbra has reminded us, Groups, were more, groups are more immoral than individuals. We know through the painful experience that freedom is never voluntarily given up by the oppressor. It must be demanded by the oppressed. Frankly, I had never engaged in a direct action movement that was well-timed according to the timetable of those who have not suffered unduly from the disease of segregation. For years now, I have heard the word wait. It rings in the ears of every Negro and person familiarity. This weight has almost meant never. It has been tranquilizing the homicide, revealing the emotional stress of the moment, and only give birth to an ill-informed infant of frustrations. We must come to see with the distinguished jurists of yesterday that justice too long delayed is justice denied. We have made it more, more than 340 years for our God-given and constitutional rights. The nation of Asia and Africa are moving jet like speed to their goal of political independence. And we still creep at the horse and buggy pace towards the gang of a cup of coffee at a lunch counter. I guess it's easy for those who have never felt the stinging darts of segregation to say, wait. But when you have seen the vicious mobs attack your mother and fathers at will, and drown your sisters and brother at whim, and when you have seen a hate filled policeman curse, kick, brutalize, and even kill your black brothers and sisters with impunity, and when you see the vast majority of your 20 million Negro brothers smothered at an airtight cage of poverty in the midst of an affluent society, when you can suddenly not find your tongue twisted in your speech and your stammer as you seek to explain to your six-year-old daughter why she cannot go to a public amusement park that had just been advertised on television, and see the tears swell up in her eyes 
when she is told that Funky Town, Fun Town is closed to colored children. And a see the depressing clouds of inferiority begin to form in her little mental sky. And we begin to distort her little personality while I consciously develop a bitterness towards white people. When you have, have concocted an answer for a five-year-old son asking the antisonite petals, Daddy, why do white people treat colored people so mean? When you have taken a cross-country drive and find out to sleep night after night in uncomfortable corners of your automobile because no motel will accept you, and when you are humiliated day and night, day in and day out, by nagging signs reading white and colored, and when your first name becomes nigger, and your middle name becomes boy, however old you are, and your last name becomes John, and your last name becomes John, and your wife and mother are never getting a respected title of missus, and we are harassed by day and hunted by night by the fact you are a Negro constantly living constantly at the tippy toe stands, never knowing when the next plague and interferes of auto resentments, and when you are forever fighting a degenerate sense of nobodiness, then you will understand then you will understand why we find it difficult to wait. There is time when a couple of endurance run over and men are no longer willing to be pledged to a bits of injustice where their experience of bleakness are corroding despair. I hope so you can understand our legitimate and unavoidable patience. You express a great deal of anxiety over our willingness to break laws. This is a certain legitimate concern, since we are also diligent to argue with people to obey the Supreme Court decision in 1954 outlawing segregation in public schools. It is rather strange and paradoxical to find us consciously breaking laws. One may ask, well, how do you advocate breaking some laws and obeying others? The answer is found in the fact that there are two types of laws. There are just laws and there are unjust laws. Would agree with St. Andrew, St. Augustine, that an unjust law is no law at all. Now, what's the difference between the two? How does one determine when a law is just or unjust? A just law is a man-man code that squares with the moral law or the law of God. An unjust law is a code that is out of harmony with moral law. To put in the terms of St. Thomas Aquinas, an unjust law is a human law that is rooted in eternal and natural law. Any law that uplifts human personality is, is just. Any law that degrades human personality is unjust. All segregated statutes are unjust because of the false sense of inferiority. I use the words of Martin Brubham, the great Jewish philosopher. Segregation substitutes an I in it and a relation for I thou relationship and ends up regulating persons to the status of things. So reg segregation is not only a political, economical, and sociologically unsound, but it's morally wrong and sinful. Paul Tillich has said that sins is separation. Is not segregation an essential expression of man's tragic separation, an expression of his unlawful engagement, estrangement, his terrible sinfulness? So I can argue, urge man today to obey the 1954 decision of the Supreme Court because it is morally right. I can urge them to disobey segregation ordinance because they are morally wrong. Let us turn to a more concrete example of just and unjust laws. An unjust law is the code of, that the majority inflicts on the minority, and that itself is binding. This is the difference made legal. On the hand, is, an unjust, is a just code law is a code that a majority compels the minority to follow, and is willing to follow itself. This is the same as made legal. Let me give another explanation. An unjust code unjust law is the code inflicted upon the minority which the minority had no part in acting or creating because it did not have an unhampered right to vote who could say that the legislature of Alabama which has set up segregation laws is democratically elected throughout the state of Alabama all types of convining methods are used to prevent the Negro become registered for voters there are some counties without a single Negro registered to vote despite the fact that Negroes constitute a majority of the population. Can any law set up in such a state be considered democratically structured? 
These are just a few of unjust and just laws. There are some examples when a law that is just on its face and unjust in the application. For instance, I was arrested Friday on a charge of parading without a permit. Now, there is nothing wrong with the ordinance that requires a permit for a parade. But when the ordinance is used to preserve segregation and to deny the citizens of the First Amendment privilege to a peaceful assembly and peaceful protest, then it becomes unjust. Of course, there is nothing new about this kind of civil disobedience. It has been subliming in a refusal of Marciac, Meshiach, and Avogadro to obey the laws of Nebuchadnezzar because of a higher moral law was involved. They practiced sublimely by the early Christians who were willing to face hungry lions and excruciating pains of chopping blocks before submitting to a certain unjust laws of the Roman Empire. To a degree, academic freedom is reality today because Socrates practiced civil disobedience. We can never forget that everything Hitler did in Germany was legal, and everything the Hungarian freedom fighters did in Hungary was illegal. It was illegal to aid and cover a Jew in Hitler's journey. But I'm sure if I had lived in Germany during that time, I would have aided and covered my Jewish brothers, even though it was illegal. If I had lived in a communist country today, where certain principles dear to the Christian faith were suppressed, I believe I would openly advocate disobeying these anti-religious laws. I must make two honest confessions to you, my Christians and Jewish brothers. First, I must confess that over the last few years, I have been gravely disappointed with the white moderate. I have reached an unregrettable decision, a regrettable conclusion, that the Negro's greatest stumbling block and his stride to our freedom is not the white citizen concern or the KK Ku Klux Klaner, but the white moderate who is devoted to more order than justice, who prefer a negative peach, which is the absence of distance to a positive peace, and which is the presence of justice who constantly say, I agree in your goals you see, but I cannot agree with your methods of direct action. Who pernatilistically feels that he can set the timetable for another man freedom who lives by the myth of time. And who consistently advise the Negro to wait for more of a convenient season. Shallow understanding of a people, from a people of goodwill is more frustrating than absolute misunderstanding, misunderstanding from a people of ill will. Lukewarm acceptance is much more bewildering than outright rejection. In your statement, you assert that our actions, even though peaceful, must be condemned because they precipitate violence. But, can this assertion be logically, logically made? Isn't this like condemning the robbed man because his possessions of money participated in an evil act of robbery? Isn't this like condemning Socrates because his unwavering commitment to the truth and political divergence uh, participated in a misguiding popular mind to make him drunk to drink the hemlock? Isn't this like condemning Jesus because his unique God consciousness and never ceasing devotion to his will participated in the evil act of crucifixion? We must come and see a federal court has consistently confirmed that, immoral, that it is immoral to urge an individual to withdraw his efforts to gain his basic constitutional rights because of the quest to precipitate violence. Society must protect the robbed and to punish the robber. I had hoped that all white moderates will reject the myth of time. I received this letter. I received a letter this morning from a white brother in Texas which said, All Christians know that colored people will receive equal rights eventually. But it's possible that you are too great in a religious hurry. It has taken a Christian almost 2,000 years to accomplish what it has. The teachings of Christ take time to come to earth. All that is said here grows out of tragic misconception of time. It is strangely irrational notion that there is something in a very flow of time that will evidently cure all ills. Actually, time is neutral. It can be used either destructively or constructively. I am coming out to feel that the people of ill, of Ill will have used time much more effectively than the people of goodwill. We have to repent in this generation, not merely for the virtual words and actions of the bad people, but the appalling silence of the good people. We must come to see our human progress never tolls in the wheels of inevitability. It comes from the tireless effort, persistent work of men willing to be co-workers with God, and without this hard work time, 
in itself, you become an ally of the forces of social stagnation. You spoke of the activities of Birmingham to the stream. At first, I was rather disappointed in my fellow clergymen to see nonviolent efforts of those uh, as those of the stream. I started thinking about the fact that I stand in the middle of two opposing forces in the Negro community. One force of complacency made up of Negroes who, as a result of long years of oppression, have been so completely drained of self-respect and a sense of somebodyness, they are just as a segregation. And on the other hand, a few Negroes in the middle class who have a degree of economic and, ec economic and academic security and because of the points of profits of segregation have unconsciously become insensitive to the problem of the masses. The other force is one of bitterness and hatred, and it comes particularly close of those advocating violence. It is breast expressed in various black national groups that are springing up over the nation, the largest and best known being Elijah Muhammad's Muslim movement. This movement is nourished by a contemporary frustration over continual existence of racial discrimination. It is made up of people who have lost faith in America and who have absolutely repudiated Christianity and those that have concluded that the white man is an uncurable devil. I have tried to stand in between these two forces saying that we need not to follow the do-nothingness of the complacent or the hatred in the spirit of the black nationalists. There is a more excellent way of love and nonviolent protest. I am grateful to God that although even though the Negro church dimensions of nonviolence have entered our struggle. If this philosophy had not emerged, I am convinced that by now many of the streets of the South will be flowing with floods of blood. I am further convinced that our white brothers dismissed as robber rousers and outside agitators because of those who are working through the channels of nonviolent direct action refuse to support our nonviolent efforts. Millions of Negroes, out of frustration and despair, will seek silence and security in black nationalist ideologies, a development that will lead inevitable to a frightening racial nightmare. Oppressed people cannot remain oppressed forever. The urge of freedom will eventually come. This will happen to the American Negro, something within that has reminded us of his birthright and freedom, something within that has reminded that he can gain it. Consciously and unconsciously, he has been swept in by what the Germans call the Zeitix. And with his black brothers in Africa and his brown and yellow brothers in Asia, South America, and the Caribbean, he is moving towards a sense of cosmic urgency towards the promised land of racial justice. Recognize this vital urge that has engulfed the Negro community once it's readily understand the public demonstrations. The Negro has pent up many resistance and latent frustrations. He has to get them out. So let him march sometimes. Let him have his prayer miracle mitch at City Halls. Understand why he must have sit-ins and freedom rise. He represents the emotions that do not come to these nonviolent ways. They come out of the ominous expression of violence. This is not a threat. This is a fact of history. So I have not said to my people, go get rid of your discontentment. But I have tried to say this is a normal and healthy discontent in which can be channeled through a creative outlet of nonviolence direct action. Now, this approach is being dismissed as extremeness. I must admit, I have been initially disappointed in so being categorized. But I continue to think of the matter, and I gradually gain a bit of satisfaction from being considered an extremist. Was not Jesus an extremist in love? Love your enemies and bless those that curse you? Pray for them despite they use you? Was not Amos an extremist for justice? Let justice roll down like waters and righteousness from a mighty stream? Was not Paul an extremist for the gospel of Jesus Christ? I bear in my body the marks of the Lord Jesus. Was not Martin Luther an extremist? For, was not Martin Luther an extremist? Here I stand, and I know other, so help me God. Was John Bunyan an extremist? I will stay in jail to the end of my days before I make a mockery of my consciousness. Was Abraham Lincoln an extremist? This nation cannot survive half slave and half free. Was Thomas Jefferson an extremist? We hold these truths to be self evidence that man is created equal. So the question is not whether we are extremists, but what kind of extremists we will be. We'll be extremists for hate, or we'll be extremists for love. We'll be extremists for the prevention of injustice, or we'll be extremists for the cause of injustice. I hope that the white moderate will see this. Maybe I'm too optimistic. Sidebar, yes, she was. 
Maybe I spent too much. Sidebar, yes, you did. I guess I can clearly realize that a few members of a race that oppose another race can understand and appreciate the deep groans and the passionate yearnings of those that have been oppressed. I still fewer and still fewer have the vision that injustice must be rooted out by strong and persistent determined action. I am thankful, however, that some of our white brothers have grasped the meaning of social revolution and committed themselves to it. They are still too small in quantity, but they are big in quality. Some, like Ralph Gill, Mullian and Smith, Harry Golden, and James Dabbs, have written about our struggle in eloquent and prophetic understanding terms. Others have marched down with us in the nameless streets of the South. They sat in lunch counters and rolled with freedom rights with us. They languished in filthy, roach infested jails and suffered abuse and brutality of angry policemen who seen them as dirty nigger lovers. They, unlike many of their modern brothers, unlike many of their modern brothers, have recognized the urgency of the moment and seen the need of powerful action antidotes to combat disease of segregation. And we're gonna stop right there. There's two more pages left, but we're gonna stop right there. And um so yes, he was disappointed in the white moderates and how they were just doing too much, you know, against the cause. Let's read one more page. We just go one more. Let me rush on my mention of my other disappointment. I've been disappointed with the white church and the leadership, of course. There are some notable exceptions. I am not mindful of the fact that each of you are taking some significant stance on the issue. I commend you, Reverend Stallings, for your Christian stance this past Sunday and welcoming Negroes into your Baptist church worship services on a non-segregated basis. I commend the Catholic leaders in this state for integrating the Spring Hill College several years ago. But despite the notable sessions, I honestly reiterate that I have been disappointed with the church. Not to say that those who negatively strict critics who can find always always find something wrong with the church. I say the minister of the gospel who loves the church, who nurtured his bos- in his bosom, has been sustained by his spiritual blessing, will remain true as long as the cord of life shall lengthen. I had a strange feeling when I suddenly caught up onto the leadership of the bus protest in Montgomery a few years ago that we have the support of the white church. I felt white ministers, priests, and rabbis of the South will be some of the strongest allies. Instead, some few have been outright opponents, refusing to understand the freedom movement and the misrepresentation of its leaders. Too many others have been cautious, then courageous, and many remain silent behind the instant scrutiny security of a stained glass window. In spite of my shattered dreams in the past, I came to Birmingham with the hope that right religious leadership of this community will see the injustice for our cause and with deep moral concern serve as a channel through which our just grievances could get to the power structure. I had hoped that each of you would understand, but again I have been disappointed. I have heard numerous religious leaders of the South call upon their works to comply with the desegregation decision because of the law. But I have longed to hear white ministers say, follow this decree because integration is morally right and the Negro is your brother. In the midst of blatant injections inflicted upon the Negro, I watched white churches stand on a sideline and merely mouth pious irrelevancies and sacrimony trivialities. In the midst of a mighty struggle to rid our nation of racial and economic injustice, I have heard so many ministers say, those social issues which the gospel has nothing to do with. I have watched so many churches commit themselves completely to other worldly religions which may strain the case between the body and soul and the sacred and the secular. There was a time when the church was powerful, and during that period of the early Christians rejoiced when they were deemed worthy to suffer for what they believe in. In those days, the church was not merely a thermometer in the recorded ideas and principles of popular opinion. It was a thermostat that transformed morals of society. Whenever early Christians entered a town of power structure, they got disturbed and immediately sought to convict them from bringing disturbance of the peace and outside agitators, but went on with conviction that they were a colony of heaven and they obeyed God rather than man. They were a small number but big in commitment. They were too God intoxicated and astronomically intimidated and they brought an end to such ancient evils as infratricide and a gladiatorial conquest. Things are now different. The contemporary church is often so weak and effectual voice with a certain sound of sound. 
it is often an arch supporter of the status quo. Far from being disturbed by the presence of the church, the power structure of the average community is sold by the church, often vocal sanctions of things they are. But the judgment of God is upon the church and is never before. If the church today does not recapture the sacrificial spirit of the early church, it would lose its authentic ring and forfeit the loyalty of millions and dismiss an irrelevant social club with no meaning for the 20th century. I meet young people every day who disappoint what the church has risen to outright discuss. I hope the church as a whole will meet the challenges in this decisive hour. But even if the church does not come to the aid of justice, I have no despair about the future. I have no fear about the outcome of our struggles in Birmingham. Even our moments are presently under, misunderstood. We will reach a goal of freedom in Birmingham and all over the nation because the goal of America is freedom. Abused and scorned though we may be, our destiny is tied up with the destiny of America. Therefore, before the Plymouth landed on Plymouth, we were here. Before the pen of Jefferson scratched across the pages of history, the majestic words of the Declaration of Independence, we were here. For more than two centuries, our foreparents labored here without wages. They made cotton king. They built home for their masses amidst brutal injustice and shameful humiliations. And yet, out of that balance of vitality, our people continue to develop, thrive and develop. It is inexpressible cruelties of slavery cannot stop us. The oppressions that we now face, we surely feel. We begin our freedom with our secret heritage of our nation and our eternal will of God embodying our echoing demands. I must close now, but before closing, I am compelled to mention one other point in your statement that troubled me profoundly. You warmly condemn, condemn the day. The, the, you warmly condemned, commended, you warmly commended the Birmingham police force for keeping order and preventing violence. I do not believe you have warmly commended the police force if you have seen angry violent dogs literally biting six unarmed and unviolent Negroes. I don't believe you'd be quickly to condemn the policemen if you will observably their ugly and inhumane treatment of Negroes of the city here in the city jail. If you watch them push and curse old Negro women and young girls, if you see them slap and kick old Negro men and young boys, if you would observe them, as they have on a, did on two occasions, refusing us food because we want to sing our grace together, I'm sorry I cannot join you in the praise of the police department. It is true they have been rather disciplined in the public and handling the demonstrators. In this sense, they are publicly nonviolent, but for what purpose? To preserve an evil system segregation? Over the last few years, I consistently preached that nonviolence demands that we mean to use the pure ends of the we seek. So I have tried to make it clear that it is wrong to use immoral means to gain moral ends. But now I must affirm that it is just as wrong to use more or even moral means to preserve immoral ends. I wish I commended the Negro demonstrations of Birmingham, demonstrators of Birmingham for their sublime courage and their willingness to suffer and their amazing discipline in the midst of inhumane provocation. One day the South will recognize those real heroes. It will be James Meredith, courageously with a majestic sense of purpose, facing jeers and hostile mobs and agonizing loneliness that characterize the life of the pioneer. It will be the old, oppressed, battered Negro woman, symbolized a 70-year-old woman of Montgomery, Alabama, who rose up with a sense of dignity when her people decided not to ride the bus, segregated buses. In a response to one who inquired of her tightness and her ungrammable profundity, my feet is tired, but my soul is rested. They will be young high school and college students, young ministers of the gospel, and hosts of the elderly and courageous nonviolence in their lunch counters, and willing to join the conscience of Satan. One day, the South will be that when these diminished children, and this is with these disinherited children of God, who sat on lunch counters, with a reality stand up for the best of the American American dream and the most sacred values of our Judeo Christian heritage. Therefore, I have written this letter, I have written a letter this long, or should I say book? I'm afraid that it's too long to take your precious time, but I can assure you that if it had been much shorter, I've been writing from a comfortable desk. But there is to do when you have lonely days full of dull monotony and a narrow jail cell, others than to write long letters, think strange thoughts, and pray long prayers. 
if I had said anything in this letter that is an understanding, understatement of truth and a vindication of the reasonable practice, I beg you to forgive me. If I say anything in this letter that is an overstatement of truth and indicative of any of my having a presence that has made me patient than less than anything of brotherhood, I beg God to forgive me. And there you have it. That's the whole letter to Birmingham jail where King was disappointed with the clergy. He was scared of black nationalism at this time, as you see. He disappointed with the right moderate because he said the white folks were supposed to help out, but they never did. They had their own scenario they was dealing with, you know what I'm saying, which is keeping white supremacy. And that's one thing King didn't really wake up to until the end, that it was, you know, they were still they were still holding him back. You know, now it's not the perfect to hold him back. You know what I'm saying? And... You know, they gave him little trinkets and stuff like that. I gave, he earned and fought for little trinkets. They still hold that back and took it away from him because the ultimate goal of these people be the white liberal or the white wolf or the conservative, you know what I'm saying, is to maintain white supremacy, you know. So he was really disappointed with the, liberal, the, the liberals. And like I said right here, <clears throat> that he was worried about, and I'm going to read it out, is the other forces one is bitterness and hatred that come out of peril close to advocating violence. So he pointed to put it off on somebody else. Now we not advocating violence, somebody else is. It is expressing the various black national groups that are springing up over the nation. The largest and best known being Elijah Muhammad's Muslim movement. This movement is nourished by the complaints of contemporary frustration over the continued existence of racial discrimination. It is made up of people who have lost faith in America and who was absolutely reputed to create Christianity. So he was saying, I'm a black, I'm an American, I'm a black Christian American, and you're a white Christian American, so we should be brothers against this, in the kind of way he was implying that. Anyway, this is a Coast Gift Fun Day, you know what I'm saying, much love to this brother, you know what I'm saying, he was winding his way, and you know, like us, we still trying to find our way, trying to make stuff happen. Hey, subscribe to the channel, because we drop African history like this all day, every day. Peace.